So we had this really audacious goal in 2013, 2014, that we would actually create with the Mass Open Cloud, you know, a self-sustained public cloud. Um, you know, not trying to compete with Amazon or compete with Google, but something that was open, an alternative model of cloud where many different parties could participate. Um, and, but it had to be at scale. It had to be big enough that people could use it for production uses, because without that, you're not really studying the real problems. And a test bed where research could get involved, where industry could get involved, um, and do innovation where, you know, today if you want to work in a public cloud, you basically have to go work in a public cloud. You have no visibility into what's going on inside it. So that was our crazy dream back in 2000, 2014. Um, it's somewhat real. We actually have the Mass Open Cloud, which uh, Peter's going to be talking about. Um, we have a set of core industry partners who've contributed enormously to this effort. Um, and uh, we have a community of researchers that have been using this as a platform where they can do innovative research and end users that are just users of this platform. Um, for the most part, they're experimental users, as we'll talk about, but still users that are just trying to get their work done. The new announcements that you hear about through the rest of the session is, first of all, the Open Cloud Testbed, uh, funded by NSF. Um, this is to actually open up the opportunity to do research in the cloud from a regional um, group of researchers to the whole nation. Um, and Mike will be talking about that. Um, the Open Infrastructure Labs, uh, which is an effort by the OpenStack Foundation, we had a set of core industry partners involved, but we could never sustain or have the ability to have hundreds of companies involved in the effort. And eventually, that's what we need you know, to expose the innovation to that. And so that's the new effort um, that we'll be talking about with uh, the OpenStack Foundation. And we've been sort of with a very, very small team, as Peter talked about, trying to support a community of users. Now this is getting real. So the New England Research Cloud is what Scott and Wayne will be talking about, which is a new opportunity to create a production cloud, a real production cloud. And finally, Hugh's going to be talking about Operate First. The problem with an acronym that starts with O with all the other acronyms that start with O is I keep wanting to say open, but it's Operate First, um, which is an effort to actually <coughs> allow us to rapidly expose innovation and new efforts to the community and operate it before it's, actually I'll let you talk about it. So the related initiatives that you'll be hearing about are the Mass Open Cloud, first from Peter, which is the long effort that we've started in 2013, the Open Cloud Testbed from Mike Zink, who's um, our lead PI in that effort, uh, the New England Research Cloud, which Scott and Wayne are gonna be talking about, um, Open Infrastructure Lab, which Jonathan's talking about, and I'm depending on Jen to actually keep up all of us to our time slots, and finally operate first. So with that, I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you. Um, I think I'll stand at the podium. Um, so, so I'm Peter Desnoyers from Northeastern uh, with Iran. I'm one of the PIs. We're the PIs of the Mass Open Cloud. And so I wanted to talk a bit about how we got here. So it all starts with the MGHPCC. Uh, I'm sure most of you know about this. It's uh, the, you know, it's a Northeastern, BU, Harvard, MIT, UMass all got together and built a state-of-the-art 15 megawatt data center out in Holyoke, uh, oh, with the state of Massachusetts and some additional partners um, under the leadership of, it's been running under the leadership of John Goodhue, it's got about an acre of machine room space, ter tremendous network connectivity, and room to grow. So why is it important? Because actually networking together institutions across distances is really hard. So to give an example, the NSF paid millions of dollars to connect together, to build and operate the Pacific Research Platform. This is you know, network connecting together the big universities in California. Now, imagine shrinking that down into a single machine room. And really, um, you know, the research enterprise in Massachusetts is of you know, quite as big but comparable size to the Pacific Research Platform, and where it took years of planning and millions of dollars to put a few links between those universities. If I want to put a link between Northeastern and BU, the hardest part is drive, and most expensive part is driving out to Holyoke and back. Um, so it's it's amazing the collaborations 
And the Mass Open Cloud is only one of many collaborations that has arisen from you know, this amazing resource that people had the foresight to create. So anyway, back to uh, the, the Mass Open Cloud. So, you know, um, as Iran was saying, back in 2013 or so, so Iran and I first met at VMware back when we were both in industry. And when we got into academia, we had this crazy idea about creating an open cloud. You know, one where you had not just cooperation, but competition. And one where a bunch of parties could create something that no single one of them could do alone. So a bunch of people believed in us. Uh, first, the MGHPCC with the seed fund grant, then the Commonwealth, and a bunch of uh, industrial partners. And in the end, this has gotten us to where we are today. Um, so, you know, what do we have? Well, we've got infrastructure, thanks in large part to some generous donations from Two Sigma and other partners. Um, we've got a bunch of services, um, thanks in large part to Red Hat's tremendous support in getting these up. Um, Bare Metal Cloud, OpenStack, OpenShift, Ceph. We've got applications running on top of these services. We've got even more infrastructure, uh, thanks to IBM for a donation of some specialized, um, you know, deep learning optimized systems. Um, we've got applications hosted on top. We've got um, the biggest being the planned migration of the Harvard Dataverse from AWS. And we're establishing connections with other projects in the MGHPCC, such as the 20 petabyte Northeast Storage Exchange. We've got a professional team, Michael, Jen, Rob, Rado, Larsh from Red Hat, Christy and Naved. And uh, could I ask you to uh, stand up? That's. <laughs> These are the folks who uh, keep this thing running. Um, We've had a much wider cast of interns, employees, collaborators, um, students over the years. I've got pictures of a few of them here, but uh, I couldn't, you know, there's over three, 100. there's over a hundred, uh, I'm told, uh, over the years. So uh, we couldn't find pictures of all of them. Um, you know, in the six years that we've been doing this, We've enabled hundreds of publications on cloud security, performance, new operating systems, um, and other areas. We've been instrumental in over $20 million in grants and, and contracts, and we're seeing increasing use in, uh, of our production cloud every year. Um, I think there's like 400 student users every year. Um, I tried to do the math last night, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to tell, but we're certainly providing, you know, $2 million a year in services to the, um, at, you know, Amazon's prices, to the uh, researchers and, and instructors in the institutions, possibly more. Uh, so, it, thanks to a lot of the people in this room here, it's been a success. And one of the things that's come out of this um, you know, one of the projects it's enabled, I'm, uh, Michael Zink from UMass is going to tell you about the open cloud test bed. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. As he said, I'm Mike Zink from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. For all the locals here, there is actually part of the state west of I-95, right? So <laughs> my benefit is actually, I, it takes me only 20 minutes to go to MGHPCC compared to most of the people here who would have to take two hours. But the downside is to get here, I have to uh, take two hours and a lot of traffic to come into the city. But it's wonderful and great to see you, uh, to see you all this morning, so welcome. So I'm, I'm the PI for the Open Cloud Testbed, that's an uh, NSF-sponsored sponsor initiative. And Peter already gave a nice introduction uh, about the MOC, and I want to tell you a little bit how we built on MOC and um, NSF Cloud uh, uh, Testbed initiatives to make uh, the efforts uh, for cloud researchers available not only on a regional basis, but, but, but you know, nationwide. 
So um, this is a commuted size community research infrastructure project uh, that started last October. And as you see on the slide here already, we really want to you know, reach out to the larger systems research community, people in, in cloud research systems, distributed systems, and networking. So clouds, cloud test beds are actually highly popular. You know, in 2014, NSF started the mid-scale uh, projects Cloud Lab and Chameleon Cloud to support researchers. Um, if you look at these uh, uh, projects, there's high demand if you ever have been trying to get resources for these projects, it's sometimes hard. It's especially hard for in front of, uh, ahead of um, deadlines for, for, for systems conferences. Um, and so we thought, what can we do to actually make um, you know, uh, resources from the MOC and later on from other projects available to the larger community in, in times of high demand? So make these research, research clouds more scalable, have them grow and have them shrink over time. Um, you see a graph that, that Rob, who's here in the audience with us, uh, published recently on the usage. And, and if you look a little bit closer, or talk to Rob in, in the break, you'll see uh, that you know, there's really high demand and there's often over subscription, so to speak, for in, ahead of certain deadlines. One of the problems we're dealing with is, and this is for good natural reasons, because everyone started at some point in time and has you know, some of their tools and software from, from, from uh, early on histories, these test beds are pretty much siloed these days. And we want to see how we can actually break these silos a little bit in our project. So um, what, what Peter already pointed out, in, the, in MOC, you have a bunch of things, a bunch of features that are really interesting for uh, the research community. There's access to cloud data sets, right? We have, we have Harvard's data universe, data verse, excuse me, where we have a lot of data we can use for experiments, running experiments, right? Having data is really important to test our new protocols, mechanisms, and so on. But we also have a lot of what we call telemetry, information about the cloud we can monitor in MOC. And we have a very, uh, and, and we have the chance of, uh, wait, I'm one behind here. Uh, we have the chance of uh, exposing experimental services then to the, 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 the users in the production service. So we as researchers can create new services that then can be evaluated by regular cloud users, which is, I think, a nice feature that you, know, you really have in other test beds. And we have a really strong collaboration with industry and good engagement here, which helps with uh, transfer to, to practice, but also with um, support and long-term sustainability, uh, thanks to the generous support of, of all the partners uh, involved here. So how do we make this now available for uh, you know, a large research community? And this is where CloudLab comes in. This was a natural path for us, because I'm also a co-PI on CloudLab. I've been working with Rob and his team uh, since, since the inception of CloudLab. And so just to give you a quick, very quick overview, CloudLab is a scientific instrument for cloud research. It started out with three main clusters in Utah, Wisconsin, and Clemson. About 15,000 cores in the beginning. It has grown significantly over time with a focus on different hardware and memory storage and networking. Um, highly popular. And it's especially what I want to point out, it's designed for reproducible research. That's very important for the systems community by being able to not only publish your results, but by also have others use the information, how you generate these results and reproduce them so they can compare them with maybe their new research, with their new research results. We see a big push by NFS, NSF and the uh, ACM and IEEE now in, in, in making more of this data, reproducible data available at conferences and, 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 and in your projects. So I think that's, that's, two, that's an important feature. The other one is the hard isolation um, between uh, projects because um, CloudLab can be shared. Uh, people can run slices, uh, sets of hardware, and can run experiments in parallel. But if you want to do it reproducible, you have to make sure it's really isolated so one experiment doesn't Im impact the other one because that would not really help you with your visibility. So a short introduction of CloudLab. What we want to do is, what, or what we are in the process of using, is using the Cloud Lab, Cloud Lab framework where you can actually use it for resources, uh, MOC re resources to run your experiments. Um, we already have a Cloud Lab cluster up and running um, at the moment. As you can see here on that slide, in MGHPCC, these are, as of Friday, 90 nodes running in the cluster. Uh, wait, I'm one, one too far ahead. 90 nodes in the cluster today, uh, thanks to the wonderful uh, donation from Two Sigma. This is going to be 100 nodes that can be used for experiments um, by the end of the year. And we're also um, um, uh, making available 15 FPGAs for the research community. Um, in addition, in the long term, and Scott and Wayne will talk to this, we will then use Elastic Secure Infrastructure, ESI, to make other hardware, other bare metal servers available at, at times of high demand. 
um, from the New England Research Club. And, um, and um, the FPGAs, we actually were motivated by that because we saw there's a lot of interest in FPGAs um, with the co-PIs Martin Herbert and Miriam Lisa who are somewhere in the room here in, in OCT. We went out to the research community and got their feedback uh, on that interest, what they would like it for. And we also see that, you know, there's not only interest in the research community, FPGAs are also now offered in commercial clouds, but this is really locked down. It's not really helpful for researchers where we want to be doing our deep core down research and get access to this. So that's why we're offering FPGAs. And in the second uh, uh, rollout, by the end of year three of the project, we'll have actually then have a total of 30 FPGAs available. This is a trend we see, um, you know, throughout um, the research community. Chameleon and Cloud Lab also are now uh, offering FPGA, GAs, FPGAs in our case. We will actually, uh, one of the core focuses is making them bump in the wire so you can use them between your network and between the processor to do some, some, some in-network processing before it gets in, into, your, into your server. So this is kind of a, a quick overview about OCT. In the core, the strong relation between MOC and OCT, the strong relation to Cloud Lab, how we want to make it available to the research community uh, outside the region. And I want to make sure that you are aware that we have a bunch of other events happening throughout the days. Uh, during the talks today, there's more uh, at 11.30 about the FPGAs. The OCT Advisory Board will meet in a closed session over lunch today. Uh, and on Tuesday, there's, there's events in the morning and also in the afternoon that have more deep information on OCT. Thank you very much. Scott Wing, any of you? I just hinted at NERC a little bit already. Um, Scott is not going to talk about New England Research Club. All right. All right, so the next experiment in this diagram, <laughs> the New England Research Cloud. Um, so Wayne and I got together about a year, I guess it's been almost, a, yeah, yeah, it's been a year ago, kind of examining the portfolio of, of research computing services that we have. We both do a lot in high performance computing. We've both seen a dramatic shift in the type of researchers and the disciplines that are trying to like force their research into high performance computing and realizing that a lot of the new types of tools are really cloud native tools. And, and trying to do Apache Spark and these other things in HPC environments, doing elastic search in an HPC environment and other types of distributed data, this doesn't really make sense. And as we, as we progress, we realize we should really run a cloud environment like we run our HPC environment, where we have a whole thing of facilitators. Um, and so that community up there that we see um, will really broaden the breadth of, of digital research that's happening at the university at a scale that we haven't seen in the past. And that's, what we, that's where we fit in. So this is just our vision slide. Next. So, one of the important parts and aspects of what we want to um, accomplish in deploying a cloud is really to enable those tech technical capable researchers to have a full realization of the type of research they want to present back to their community. What that means is give them a really nice suite of platform as a service and facilitate with them how to create software as a service for their community. Right? It's so that the tools that they envision to do their own research they want to turn around and give to others we can fully support them doing that. And in that, in the HPC space, we do a really good job and understand how to schedule resources, how to do accounting. We already have tools for all that space. We want to make sure that those tools are also available in the cloud space and that we partner with people to create the same provisioning, the same kind of accounting, telemetry, and all those. Um, and then the other aspect is facilitation. So one of the things that's kind of a missing component in all the research test beds is they don't have an enormous amount of staff that is helping end researchers use the, uh, the facilities, help them understand what are the workflows, how should I think about this? And that's one of the things that we've done in the HPC environment for years. And so that's what we're doing is we're adding actual cloud facilitators to this environment to make it much easier for researchers to take full advantage. So this is kind of a comprehensive suite of things that we're, we're talking about here. So this is just a pilot for us. It will expand in the future, attract funding from different sources, and grow as it, as it, as it does with the number of researchers using it. Yeah, so, so in terms of, 
So in terms of uh, both uh, Harvard and BU and our research computing groups, I mean, we have a very uh, long history of uh, supporting researchers uh, broadly across the community. So um, in, in a centralized way. So for BU, for instance, we support both the Charles River campus and the medical center campuses and a wide range of research communities. And we also um, are involved with uh, local cloud researchers, so the people at this table and others of you in the audience. And so I think it's a nice opportunity to meld the uh, research expertise in cloud with also the production capabilities that both of our groups can provide um, to the community. And so we've also we pointed on the importance of the human-driven facilitation. I would say one aspect that's different from this, from HBC, is that in HBC the predominant users are are this come from the STEM areas. You know, like from engineering, from chemistry, from physics. They have been doing calculations since there was a computer. Those who want to come and use large-scale cloud do not always come from that background historically within their discipline. And so there's going to be a lot more effort that's needed to onboard them and get them fully acquainted with using this. We also see this kind of as a similar way in which we have been doing with HPC with the national NSF funded, DOE funded, big scale HPC resources. We have a campus structure that, that there is a much, much larger hundreds of thousands of core type of computations that exist elsewhere. And so we have to be well versed at how to get them, get their calculations and get their workflows ready locally so they could take advantage of something like that. And so in this, they will have be exposed to both the, experiment, the experimental new technologies that exist, traditional production scale stuff that's at a campus level, and then they could bridge to a much, much larger scale. So that's an important kind of transition. And so this is just a conceptual diagram of what we're looking at for the uh, New England Research Cloud pilot. And on the left here are just the different communities of users that we have. And uh, mainly, uh, you know, researchers from higher education, but also, uh, we do a lot of academic support as well. So the same faculty that we support in research also want to teach their classes the same tools and uh, methods of doing uh, research in an academic setting. So we see NERC as being able to fulfill that as well, and perhaps at even an earlier level through uh, high school and, and middle school. And then also be able to support incubated startups in industry. And I think one of the uh, key things is that uh, for a lot of industry startups, they can't afford to have a cloud facilitator on staff and afford to have all of their infrastructure, right? And uh, have their, um, their company use it. So I think one of the things that we hope is that NERC helps enable these smaller industry uh, groups and uh, uh, we can help provide uh, guidance on the facilitation aspects for that. And then in terms of the three types of services, uh, like Scott said before, we want to be able to provide very easy access software as a service. We have some um, experience in doing this on the HPC side and the cluster side, but we'd like to be able to extend that into uh, more uh, dynamic infrastructure. And then also be able to provide infrastructure and platform as service for those research groups that need more tailored uh, support. But in hand, that has to come with a facilitation aspect so we can help those research communities actually use the platform as a service and infrastructure as a service uh, capabilities. Yeah, and so on the right, you can see the what we've been calling the innovation hub, it's just generically, which is all the different projects like Massachusetts Open Cloud, the Open Cloud Testbed, the Open Infrastructure Lab, and things that are happening at Red Hat and other, other partners as we go forward, is that this is one thing I think is the most interesting thing about what we can do within MJHPCC as comparison to just, and what sets this apart from a traditional public cloud is that there's actually research technology is being developed and can be exposed directly to the researchers. They can, they'll be able to come in and, and choose, I want to go to this development space and try something out new that may benefit my science that I'm trying to accomplish. I'm able to do it faster and then provide feedback to, to the researchers or the core technology that's being deployed in that space. And that innovation is something that we wouldn't be able to do elsewhere. And that's one of the things that we're really excited about. And that's what this partnership, I think, will, will grow and flourish in the future. And so one other project I'm going to highlight here is I expand the the storage aspect, we also have the Northeast Storage Exchange, which is an NSF-funded project between all the consortium members within MGHPCC. This has already been built out to 20 petabytes. It's essentially a data lake that we're going through all the different presentations of different types of storage and working on different proofs of concepts as we build this out. This will be a fully-fledged um, you know, storage-as-a-service space that all of the different uh, data from the, it can be a 
presented either to the production space in NERC or even to the experimental space. You can take the data sets that you already have in Nessie and be able to expose them to some new transformation through FPGAs or whatever types of, of, of technology or, or NVMe and, and any kind of disruptive technology that maybe is a little too new. Maybe firmware comes out every week on it. We've done this kind of stuff in the past. It'd be nice to know that that is in that space and, and, and then maybe in a year from now that will be mainstream and we adopt it. But their data will be able to be exposed to both of those places. So just to give you a little quick timeline um, of, of when this began, we started planning this, you know, about six months, I guess we're about a year in now in the planning stage. We started about three to six months ago um, in the kind of rolling in infrastructure. Kind of the mode we're in right now is we're taking the old HPC cluster, so we're going to have, you know, 16,000 cores that we roll in to an OpenStack environment. We'll slowly build in more complex things from infrastructure as a service to platform as a service as we need higher bandwidth. and and faster disk, and then have a, have a fair number of software as a service as we end the pilot that we can just expose to the academic community, um, expose to researchers at large, right? And the other aspect of this is that we grow the community of us that are operating this, and that we look to the future where we're actually establishing partnerships across all of MJHPCC. So just to give you a quick overview of why this is important, we have a couple of slides with proof of concept use cases. So we talk about software as a service. So things, um, things like Open Data Hub as a platform that allows people to create modular different types of, of workflows. Things like on demand that we use in the HPC space. They have a next round of funding from the NSF to do this for OpenStack and for Kubernetes. Um, Domino Data Labs, we have uh, Harvard Business School has already engaged with them and we started engaging with them uh, collectively to see would they be willing to deploy this service on-prem, which is not something they've done before and they're excited about this opportunity. So we're going down that road as well. And then, you know, I, I think very early on in the discussion uh, phase of NERC, we uh, came to a realization that success will be measured in researchers, right, in research use cases. So we're very much focusing our pilot on use cases and the success of those um, as a measure. So for BU, uh, there's just a list of three example uh, projects here that we'll be working on. One is from the Earth and Environment uh, Department on um, a PCAM, which is an ecosystem analyzer. Um, and a couple others uh, in interfacing with the SAIL, Hariri SAIL group in terms of products that they have. A couple of interests are the multi-party communication and being able to uh, set up NERC to be able to function in that capacity. And then also um, we're working on a project called Single Cell Toolkit with the Medical Center and uh, Research Computing and Hariri is, is uh, SAIL group is working on that as well. And then finally, uh, there's the Master of Science in Statistical Practice, MSSP program at BU, and they do a lot of interfacing with uh, industry and state in terms of uh, consultancy projects. And we'd like to be able to examine whether we can use NERC to be able to host those consultancy projects uh, moving forward. Just to give a few examples from Harvard, there's a, Galaxy is a commonly used uh, web platform as a front end to do different kinds of bioinformatics workflows. The, the Curtis Huttenhauer group um, particularly creates a bunch of extra tools that are in the tool shed, right? And they need a place right now, they're just running on a static VM or a single infrastructure. They need this to be elastic, right? It's taking that kind of infrastructure um, and providing it to a lot bigger, lot bigger resources on the back end. Um, both uh, Randy Buckner that's in the Neural Compute Facility, it's part of the Center for Brain Science, um, there's this concept called digital phenotyping that works with J.P. O'Neill's lab in School of Public Health. And that the device that you carry around with you can be turned on to do all sorts of things that, that they learn about, about your behavior, that may be like post-op surgery or other different types of things where it ties it to medical. Um, and so they have a whole dashboard they try to create, except for it needs, it really needs a distributed data store on the back end, not a single database on a single uh, server. Alyssa Goodman in the Center for Astrophysics um, with this glue code is a, is a web, web Python framework. Um, Francesca Dominici does a lot with taking environmental um, aspects and looking how they change um, health factors. Uh, there's been a, a number of different things that they've done for the EPA recently. And they need, they need infrastructure they can build on the fly that's secure because it might have medical data from like Medicare data in it. They also need to be able to have scalable resources to do a lot of machine learning. Okay? These are things that are challenging for them currently even when they try to go to the public cloud. They don't have somebody there where they can help them design their workflows in that way. 
Um, and then things like Center for Geographical Analysis currently run on the MOC and has run at uh, OpenStack at George Mason as well. They have a couple different places they've deployed it. We'd like to be able to give them a lot more resources and, and then help facilitate their aspect of using it. But that's a good example of infrastructure as a service. They're very well versed at doing this. Um, and this would just be a bigger resource for them. So hopefully this gives you an idea of the kind of breadth of research that can be done in the cloud that right now, most of these, it's a challenge for them to use the high performance computing space. And you know, I think just outlining some of the benefits of NERC here, um, specifically, you know, especially for BU, right? Uh, we're a very centralized research computing group and we've grown immensely in the number of departments and colleges we support at the university. And you know, back in 2012, we had, had 51 departments in sort of the areas you would think of, uh, STEM fields, uh, basic science, engineering, and, and some in the medicine area. And we've grown to 2019 where we you know, are servicing around 100 departments. We've serviced essentially every college um, at the university. And the workloads that we're trying to inject into our HPC cluster um, are growing broader and broader. And we view NERC as a great opportunity to be able to um, provide dedicated infrastructure and services to those research communities, uh, very domain-specific research. Yeah. And in the workforce development and testing space, you might not be aware of this, but in a little side research I did, 35% uh, of all degrees conferred in this state are from the five institutions that are within MJHPCC. That is a huge amount of workforce development. And so one of the things that could be interesting that come out of this with different software as a service platforms is that we truly create a data science platform that's available for, for the undergraduate curriculum. And then we, after we've done that, we can start working on that in the, in the you know, upper uh, K through 12 space. We don't, really, we don't really do a whole lot in preparing people for data analytics, but yet that's the number one thing that most people need in companies, right? The, maybe the biggest thing we teach people is how to use Excel, right, or spreadsheets. <laughs> There's a lot more rich um, ways to engage with data. And the other thing is they're not normally exposed, even, in, in, even at our universities in the undergraduate level, they're not normally exposed to really large data, right? And with this kind of resource, they could. And that's a very powerful transformation as far as the way in which you think about problems, the way in which you engage with, with information. And so that's, that's that aspect of it. And then, like we've said before, the, the resource supporting compet and in, um, competitiveness and innovation, right? The innovation hub will do all sorts of cool stuff and we'll be able to partner with them. This will allow us to think about large scale um, resources for cloud in the data center like we've done um, for HPC. And I think we'll, it'll set MJHPC as a whole in a space to be a world-class facility for cloud. Um, and that's something that we're interested in throughout this partnership to create that. So thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bryce from the OpenStack Foundation, and I want to talk a little bit about one of the new components of this overall collaboration that, uh, that Ron mentioned earlier, which was the Open Infra Labs. Um, so the, uh, the, the Open Infra Labs comes out of, um, I think, a, an overall uh, trend that, that we've seen across the consumption of technology really in industry and in academic and research and in, um, in the development of open source itself. And that is that cloud computing has really come in and changed both the demand for infrastructure and also the expectation of how that infrastructure is available. And at the same time, um, we've seen an incredible variety of new types of use cases and workloads that have kind of poured into, um, into these clouds and into these environments that, that were these kind of standard pools of, of hardware and software. And that has, um, has created uh, a lot of opportunity, but it's also created a lot of challenges. Um, I work in the open source space, and sometimes we say that, uh, that the, uh, the, the best thing about open source is that there's more of it than ever before, and the worst thing about open source is that there's more of it than ever before. <laughs> And it, it's something that has, uh, has created an environment where there's really rapid innovation, but at the same time, you know, are we 
slowing down and thinking about how does this get used? How does it help enable these growing data centers, these growing use cases, these new diverse architectures and, and types of workloads that, that people want to, uh, want to run? Um, so uh, uh, I guess about a year ago now, um, we started speaking with, uh, with the MOC team and, uh, and Red Hat and some of the other industry partners involved about an opportunity to, uh, to bring together a broader community with a specific focus on um, solving kind of the production gap that sometimes exists around these, these very popular open source projects. Um, OpenStack has been mentioned a couple of times as, as one of the key uh, open source components in a lot of these clouds. Kubernetes is another very popular project. Ceph was mentioned as well. And all of these are open source projects that have large global communities, a lot of active software development happening, a lot of users, but no one ever runs any one of these individual projects, and that's the only thing they run. You know, no one only runs OpenStack, no one only runs Kubernetes, no one only runs Ceph. And what, um, what I think we saw a big opportunity around this to do was to create an environment where we bring people together with the specific focus of, of creating um, fully tested, production ready patterns and use cases around these very core open source projects. Um, the OpenStack Foundation community has, uh, has grown in the last um, seven years since we started the foundation to be over 100,000 members in uh, almost 200 countries and hundreds of companies. And so this is a, a very broad, diverse, global group of people who are working on not just OpenStack, which is kind of where we started, um, but on all of these other technologies. And so I think that there's uh, an awesome um, collaboration that, uh, that's possible here to bring together these community members um, along with a lot of people who are, are really trying to make it work on a day-to-day -day basis with limited resources and demanding users and exciting um, use cases. The, uh, uh, Ron mentioned earlier too that one of his goals has been to expand uh, beyond kind of the core industry partners for the MOC. And at the OpenStack Foundation, we have around 500 companies who are part of our community, who contribute to the software, who um, fund our efforts. Uh, our core group of, of partners is our, our uh, platinum and gold members. And, uh, and you know, this spans a lot of the largest IT companies um, all around the world. And what's awesome is, is when, uh, when we can bring a community like this together, then we can, uh, I think, make real progress in the underlying technology that then has benefits that, that go out in ways that we don't even really understand. You know, I, I mentioned that um, you know, if you look at, at a standard cloud environment today, like any of these environments that, that we've already heard about, or even a commercial environment at, um, at, at, at uh, a big user like Verizon, who is going to be joining a panel this afternoon, um, they have many, many, many components that make up those clouds. And, uh, and so what often happens in the open source world is that each of those components kind of gets developed independently by a group of open source developers who work daily on their project and, uh, and, and have their own sets of goals and, and their own kind of milestones for progress. And that has resulted in incredible technology creation for, um, for everyone to be able to take advantage of in the open source world. But at some level, it also becomes a little bit like a, uh, a product company where every component of a product is developed in a silo between different engineers and designers who don't really see how the end result is supposed to come together. Whether that's a car or a coffee machine, it doesn't really work if everything kind of happens in these silos. And to some extent, that's what we see in, in the open source world today. And that is what I think is creating a big challenge for, um, for the adoption of, of different open source tools into production environments, especially for, um, for organizations that, uh, that don't have um, kind of vast technical resources to throw at the problem. So um, the way that, that I think about Open Infra Labs is it's an opportunity to focus on that last mile of integration for open source software. And, uh, and to do this properly, 
you, you need not just um, uh, kind of an artificial or a synthetic test environment. You really need real world labs and real world environments where you can put these software components together, operate them, have arbitrary use cases on them, and learn from that. And that is what is, uh, is super powerful about the set of, of clouds that, um, that's being built here is that you know, they provide that opportunity um, to partner and to learn and then to go back and make fundamental improvements in the underlying software communities. Um, I think the other piece that, uh, that is really valuable is around creating um, a broader community of, of practice around running these open source clouds. Um, I, I think uh, uh, when, when we were um, just getting the, the day kicked off and the mention of, of kind of how you know, clouds, it's kind of like still a, a wow thing when you think about what it's enabling and the, uh, the pace of adoption and change that's happening. And that means that there is still a lot of education, uh, still, still a lot of documentation, still a lot of um, just general information sharing that needs to happen. Um, but again, most of the communities that exist are very oriented around individual projects and individual components. And, uh, and, and what um, the MOC has already spawned here in this region is an incredible community of practice around putting all of these components together, operating them for real world scenarios. And, uh, and so another aspect of uh, Open Infra Labs is we wanna take that and we wanna make that something that can draw in uh, participants from all over the globe and all over um, these various communities and bring them together with that same goal. So I think that, uh, that you know, this is a super huge opportunity that, that um, could really improve the, the experience and, uh, and kind of the state of um, open source adoption within the cloud space. So um, you know, as we look towards the future and how we want to, uh, to actually approach this, as I said, you know, I think that, that um, these can't just be kind of synthetic or artificial test environments. We need real environments. And, um, and that's the great benefit that uh, the MOC and the Open Cloud Testbed and the NERC provide. They give us great um, environments with real world usage that shows us not just kind of what the hardware should look like, what the virtualization should look like, but also what the applications running above that should look like. And, and where are the gaps? You know, how do you do self sign up? How do you do uh, monitoring? How do you do usage tracking? And so, um, you know, to start with, we're going to prioritize those environments and, uh, and the work that's happening right here because it's such a great and valuable um, opportunity to learn from, um, from real world usage. And over the next year or two, we, uh, we're going to continue to expand um, to bring in more organizations and, and other institutions that want to follow that pattern and learn from it. And as we do that, what, what I think we will have the opportunity to really see um, through these stages is when we can build um, clouds with uh, the same technology in similar ways, collaborating on it, then we get to really, really powerful opportunities for federation, for sharing um, these resources across these environments. And, uh, and, and that's something that we've already heard again, how some of these environments, they get maxed out at certain times. You know, there are seasonal demands around, uh, around research that can put these environments to their peak usage. And, uh, and so how can we build a federated network of environments that can add to that capacity, can create a bigger footprint, and can partner again with industry to, uh, to sort of create that limitless amount of compute and storage that, uh, that, that seems to be what the world <laughs> it just demands more and more of every single day. So um, I think the, uh, the, you know, this is a, um, a new effort that's really just getting underway this year. A lot of ways to help. Um, there, we always need people to get involved to help operate these environments, to help document what's happening. Um, we always need code contributions. We need funding from industry to, uh, to help uh, provide the hardware and the ops people. And, uh, and we need also um, companies who are, who are willing to partner with this uh, to, to look at kind of how over the future, how do we improve the technology, but how do we also improve the operations and, uh, and the connections between all of these different environments. And we've already had some, uh, some great initial collaborations with, uh, with companies like Intel and uh, Red Hat 
and Futureway and Cisco and others and, um, and have more that I think we're gonna see get involved this year. So I'm very, very excited to see um, how this is all coming together and also um, super happy to be able to be here for, uh, for this event. Uh, a lot of people here that I don't know and, uh, and I, I always like that because it means there's a lot for me to, to learn and, and hear that, uh, that I get to hear for the first time. So if you wanna join the Open Lab, Infra Labs initiative, um, there are already some community channels that you can pr start participating in. Uh, go to openinfralabs.org and that has kind of the, uh, the overview of all of it. And, uh, and um, you know, it's, it's an open community and we need your help. And I think that, uh, like I said, if we, if we come together and, uh, and focus on these real world use cases, there's a huge opportunity to help out the industry, the open source projects, and the academic and research world in a very big way. So I think uh, Hugh is up next, is that right? Thanks, Jonathan. We have a thingy up here, right? Yes. Ah, oh, very good. Uh, okay, so I would, how do I start here? So as, as, I've been at Red Hat for 18 years. It was a very long time. Um, naturally, as a result of that, I am an open source uh, bigot, I guess you could say. And uh, I get really fired up about this stuff, so excuse me if I seem over the top. Um, I am as excited as I have ever been in my career about the opportunity that we have here, and I'm also terrified uh, I'm both terrified because I'm afraid we'll screw it up, which is entirely possible, and also because uh, the, the, the spot we're in now uh, with growing public clouds and um, in increasing demands of scale and everything else poses an existential threat for open source, and I'm going to talk about what we're going to do about that. Um, operate first is, in short, is what we're going to do about it, uh, and that's the name of this talk. Uh, so we go back, go back uh, in history a little bit. Um, back when I kind of got started in this business, um, even then before open source, uh, code was where a software company built value. You wrote code, you built it, you kept the code a secret, and then you sold the binaries or a license to the binaries for money. It's a fairly simple model, um, and it worked relatively well. Operations in that model is mostly an afterthought. Um, not that it was necessarily easy, but it was much easier to find people to keep your machines running, networked, and up to date than it was to find people to write the application code you wanted. Applications were king. And open source happened. Into this picture comes open source. This changes a few things. Um, you can see here, I dug up the press release. This was a month and a half after I started at Red Hat. Um, we released Red Hat Linux Advanced Server, was not called RHEL until another release later. Um, one of the guys I was working with at the time said, why did you name it RHEL? That was a really terrible idea. But anyway, uh, it worked. Um, we, uh, the, the, the virtue of RHEL is that it allowed large businesses with a high risk profile to safely use GPL software. Nobody could do that before because there was no vendor to stand behind it, which is what we were. That changed a lot of things, but you'll notice that the balance of value, if you will, still remains firmly on the side of the software. Uh, now, instead of just software, now we have a product, but the product is still centered around software. Um, <clears throat> so now the value the value's there. The infrastructure around the code that is the product, that is still what makes it safe for large companies to use it, and that's where the value is. The folks in the basement are still in the basement. Uh, the fact that the kernel patches they are applying are now open source doesn't really change very much about how the infrastructure gets operated. Now then in 2006 or so, maybe a little before that, uh, cloud comes along. Okay, so uh, I dug this up off of Wikipedia. Um, I was, even, even I was astonished by this. So in 2018, $25 billion dollars revenue for AWS. AWS is growing tw twice as fast as Amazon itself. Um, and all of a sudden, businesses small and large are able to grow far faster on the cloud paradigm, private, public, whatever, than they could with bare metal or even managing their own virtualization, right? 
So when scale is everything, suddenly the folks in the basement aren't in the basement anymore. The problem that businesses now needed to solve to grow and serve their customers are much more problems of scale, reliability, availability, as they, than they are problems of features and capabilities. Uh, you look at Amazon itself as an example, right? Um, the mechanics of a shopping cart and a product catalog were worked out years and years ago. The interesting work that Amazon has had to do over the last few the last decade, decade and a half, what made them valuable was they figured out how to scale it. So the value is not in the application anymore, it's in the scale. Um, this leads suddenly to a huge demand for people who understand scale and operations at scale and creates a whole new discipline called site reliability engineering um, that is devo devoted to operating at massive scale. Um, and people who have mastered that di discipline are now suddenly very highly in demand and very expensive and very rare. There's one small problem, of course, with all of this focus on scale, which is that it's very hard to do it in the open, um, both because of the lack of truly open infrastructure and because of the lack of standardization of that infrastructure. It naturally tends toward, we're going to do this in our shop, and we understand how to do it, and we're not going to get any benefit from sharing it with anybody, so why would we? Plus, it's a proprietary advantage, so on and so on. So in this world, in this new world, the really interesting bits of operations become entirely proprietary, and they start becoming proprietary to the four or five giant organizations who are operating at that, what we call now hyperscale. Open source has a problem. And we believe that operate first is the solution. If you care about open source, what do you do in this scenario? Um, fortunately, it's fairly clear to me, at least, and to everybody sitting at this table, I think, uh, that the only path forward is something similar to what happened with open source in the 90s. We have to find a way to drag operations into the open because ops is now just as important as code, if not more so. When we were learning at Red Hat how to make a business with an open source development model, yes, Paul, I said open source development model, uh, <laughs> That's an inside joke. Uh, we, we developed a prescription called Upstream First. The principle that before we shipped a single line of code in a Red Hat product, it must have landed, must have been accepted in an Upstream community. Uh, in the Upstream project that corresponded to the product we were shipping. Now, I want to tell you, um, as somebody who's been at Red Hat for a long time, I have personally been in arguments with customers about why we couldn't ship them the patch that they wanted us to ship them because it hadn't landed upstream yet. This is not cheap, it's not easy, it's not a, um, it's not an easy, it's a very painful thing to do. But it is absolutely critical if you don't ship upstream first, then you fork from upstream and eventually you die. There's, there's no two ways about it. Um, <clears throat> today we are in need of a new principle and it is called operate first. We have, to open open, we have to open source cloud operations by opening, operating upstream projects and our products as surface services. We have to operate those services in the open, and we have to accept patches from a community that has an interest in deployment code, in monitoring dashboards, in the upgrade process, in reference architectures, and in best practice documents. We have to scrupulously put our own patches to those artifacts into, and move the speaker notes up, I hope, yes, into the upstream just as we do with the code we ship, and we have to insist that no feature ships to our customers before we have first operated that feature in the open with real world workloads. So this is called Operate First, and we believe it will make operations at scale the property of an open community, thereby enabling our customers and the world to operate their own private clouds without requiring a team of genius SREs. Operate First is the key to an open cloud, the key to successful growth of distributed systems in the open, and the key to the legacy of democratized access to the tools of the trade that the open source movement launched so many years ago. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I guess what I wanted to do at this point was, this has been an incredible group effort to get us to this point. Um, 
this huge support from MIT and CSAIL, from BU and Harvard Research IT, from Northeastern University's IT organization that's provided tremendous space and resources, and most recently UMass is sort of really joining into this effort. Um, the MGH PCC, John Goodhue, um, Jim Culbert, who've uh, kind of provide guidance and resources all along, Hariri, which hosted the effort, an incredible team of engineers, graduate students that have kind of put this thing together. Um, the Engineering Times strategic advice, in-kind support from our industry partners, um, Intel, Two Sigma, Red Hat, as well as Dell and Lenovo and Cisco and NetApp over time. Um, in fact, I was, it was cool to see Dave Aran here, who, the only person in the industry who has name confusion with me, but um, who actually uh, provide us with our first major uh, infrastructure out of Cisco. Um, so it's been a huge community that's gotten us to this point. Um, I'd also like at this point to sort of really thank um, Two Sigma. Mark, are you here? Somewhere? Yeah, so stand up, please. I mean, so this was, this was awesome. We just got 180 slightly used servers um, from Two Sigma, which is, I mean, we're actually able to put at scale, you know, a, uh, this is the second of two major infrastructure donations from Two Sigma. What's that? 4,000 pounds? 8,000 pounds of computers. Um, that were um, put into the data center. I mean, this is immediately offered us to do a bunch of operations. These are slightly used, but the scale nobody else has access to in our kind of environment. Um, so this is actually going to go into um, the open cloud test bed and the MOC and be able to move back and forth. You know, like the test beds we've had till now have been dedicated to a research community that all has the same publication deadline. What do you think happens when NSDI or OSDI is coming up? Now we have the capability of moving infrastructure, first between the MOC and the open cloud test bed, and then eventually, um, with the work we're doing with the Ironic team, Julia's sitting over there, to into um, getting this in production into the HPC clusters. Imagine we can move hundreds of thousands of cores of compute um, into this environment. And the other big recent thing is Red Hat, thank you, $22 million in new Red Hat subscriptions um, for the next few years, which is, really allows us to stand this up Yes, it's great open source, but it's also great to have a support organization you can call when something's going wrong. So um, knowing that we're not locked into anything, but we can actually get help is actually incredibly useful. So this is the latest in a series of strong contributions from industry partners. Thank you. Um, so uh, you know, what you've heard is about a set of interrelated efforts. The mass open cloud, um, the uh, Open Cloud Test, but the New England Research Cloud. So, you know, this, this is a set of interrelated efforts. This isn't just about uh, bringing Scott and Wayne out of the basement. Um, you know, th these guys, you know, if you look at it, we've been talking now about Amazon, Google offering systems at scale. Well, we've been building HPC clusters at scale for decades, right? It's, it's now bringing the capabilities of these people. These guys operate 200,000 cores of compute in the MGH PCC data center. This is unbelievable scale that's not available anywhere outside these hyperscalers. This is bringing now those capabilities, but more important than the ability to do things at scale is actually facilitators that can have the trust of domain scientists that can actually work with them to get them into a production cloud environment here. So, I mean, this is now not just the, North, the MOC, this is actually the research IT departments that have that trusted long-term position in the universities. They're taking on the production cloud element. This is about the mass open cloud as a place we can do experimentation. We can stand up, for example, new ARM servers, new power servers. We can actually expose them to researchers, and if researchers actually start using them, then we can roll them in to that production capacity, new software services. Um, the open cloud initiative, what you've heard about, is now let's take this stuff. It is no offense, and I think that, you know, um, Jonathan kind of alluded to this, it is really, really hard to stand up an open source cloud today. It is incredibly difficult. We, we have, I didn't have white hair before we started this project. You know, it was, um, we have had major failures and, um, and things that you would expect easily out of things like vCloud, for example, you know, just aren't there. The proper telemetry, um, exposing things. And it's because everybody sets it up their own way. So actually, not to say that open source shouldn't enable a diversity of offerings, but having at least one standardized offering that is reproducible and could be stand up, and then we can federate these things together is kind of, I think, a critical thing for the open source community. Um, 
then enabling and exposing all of this stuff to the research community. And what you've heard actually with Open Cloud Testbed is now we're going to have the capability for the things that we've regionally been able to do. You know, Peter and Mike and my friends in this area, now the whole nation of systems researchers will be able to do, exposing new services, having access to telemetry of a real cloud, and getting more capacity as they need it. These are kind of fundamental features of pulling this all together. And finally, you know, doing for what we've done in open source for software development, doing that for operations is, I think, going to be a fundamental requirement sort of moving forward. Now, just to be clear, we're not trying to replace, you know, the public clouds. You know, that's, that's not where this is going. This is about creating a self-sustaining project in this that, that will be reproducible so entities that have the incentives and reasons to set up their own clouds can do so much, much more easily than they can today and to enable research and development. The kinds of features that we talk about with the open cloud testbed, reproducible environments, that's not just something that researchers want. That's something that every ISV wants is to be able to actually get 100 servers or 1,000 servers um, when they're putting out a major scale deployment, right? So um, actually with the Two Sigma infrastructure, because this didn't come from NSF, we can actually make that available for startups and, and companies to do um, that kind of innovation. So it's, it's really exciting the combination of all of these things. You know, the, the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. You know, we have the opportunity here to provide a scalable cloud for uh, research users that will actually be um, economically viable. So, you know, the economics of this are incredibly compelling. I guess I can't really talk about the numbers. Um, accelerating cloud research and development. So not just research, but also development. Actually enable people from different companies to expose interesting innovation. Um, enabling broad industry involvement. You can't innovate inside Amazon's cloud if you're not Amazon, right? Um, I guess maybe, or Intel. But this is actually allowing a, a broad variety of companies to actually innovate in the clouds, greatly accelerating the open source community. So I, I love what Hugh talked about, but I actually think the potential is much larger in the long term. This isn't a short term thing, but imagine if we have a CD for the open source community. If every time you did a patch, right, it would be rolled into production in at least a small scale environment a few hours later, right, to a limited community. And then. Like, the, the productivity of the open source community would increase dramatically. I mean, that's certainly what we've seen in the hyperscalers. We need to have that for the open source community. And enabling a broad diversity of clouds to be easily stood up and then federated together. So if you remember about this at the beginning, I sort of said we had this really audacious goal for the MOC. I'm sort of feeling like we have a much broader vision today, um, which the combination of people in this room. I mean, I think every time I've seen Jonathan, it's been in person, it's been in front of an audience of like 10,000 people or something. You know, actually having this community of people, you know, dragging Wayne and Scott out of the basement. Um, it's like having this community of people coming together to lead these various efforts um, and bringing it to a larger whole is sort of super exciting. How much time do I have left? Okay, so this is, uh, I'll try to go through this blazingly fast because I was supposed to spend a lot longer at this. So um, this is the first day's agenda. Just to give you a feeling, we have Chris Wright, who's the CTO of Red Hat, who's been giving this very exciting talk about Red Hat's investment in this larger set of projects, why they're doing it, and what they're getting out of it. Um, and we're going to have Matt, um, who's going to be just talking from Intel. He's actually in quarantine, so I don't know if he's listening to this, but um, he's going to be doing it by video conference. And uh, he's uh, going to be taught, he leads a lot of sort of advanced development at Intel um, for what goes into the hyperscalers. And so the kind of things that, that he'll be talking about, actually, I don't think we've seen the abstract of it yet, but I'm really excited to hear this. Um, the, there's a whole set of micro talks in the first day. Um, these are going to be 10 minute talks. And at the end of them, we'll have a few minutes for questions. And they lead into an open time. So people can sort of leave these talks and then kind of go and meet with the speaker and ask more questions. Um, we got a very late start on the workshop. Uh, Jen will kill me if I ever do this again, um, but, uh, but we still had this phenomenal set of talks proposed. Um, so thank you for the PC through going through this massive number of talks, and this was a very restricted set of them that we could actually accept, given the timing. Um, give you time to read that? No. So um, there's, in the first sort of day of talks, there's a bunch of things that really talk about testbed capabilities. So what do we want to have in testbed? 
talk about the fabric, uh, FPGAs. So fabric is another test bed that we expect to kind of interact with and connect with. They allow networking experiments at national scale. Um, where's Ironic going, which is kind of this fundamental capability, you know, to get it to production, that ability to let people do their own provisioning, to tie it into Cloud Lab, and to be able to inf move infrastructure securely between the HPC production environments, between the MOC, between NERC, and actually into the testbed. You know, so imagine if I can move tens of thousands of cores of compute to do experiments you know, at one o'clock in the morning uh, for a researcher. That will provide capability we don't have anywhere else. Um, and then we have a set of talks that are really about doing hybrid cloud for solving scientific problems. So more about the NERC space, um, what we actually want to use in the cloud, Harvard Data Commons, which is going to be talking about you know, where Harvard actually sees you know, scientific workflows going in the future. Um, and, uh, and actually, Rory will be talking about uh, a startup that's actually talking about how they want to integrate into this and the capabilities that they can provide to universities. Um, and you know, where we see the future of storage going. So John Goodyear is going to be talking about the Open Storage Network, which is a large-scale distributed storage platform across the nation. And there's a couple of talks that I think are really much more research talks that we would fit in the other day, but scheduling conflicts, they sort of made sense to do it here. Um, and these will be sort of core research topics. Um, we then have an industry luminaries panel. And the industry luminary panel has like this incredible cast of people. You know, Mark uh, from Two Sigma, who's been core of a core partner from us. Jonathan's going to be moderating this. Uh, Gene, who's uh, responsible for a lot of Verizon's cloud, so a large-scale user of cloud. Um, uh, Stephanie, who's the GM of, uh, of the RHEL business unit. So we really have a cross-section of uh, people who are operating clouds at scale, people who are um, providing technologies for cloud at scale, um, and, uh, and people that are, um, are, yeah, I guess, that, oh, and people providing sort of, yeah, I guess that's basically it. So it's both the providers, users, and operators of clouds that are all going to be kind of represented in this. And we'll say sort of the future, what they see, where they see clouds evolving to. It's an open cloud. We left a lot of time for networking and birds of a feather session. So there's a huge set of birds of feathers. Could you look at it? So it's about five hours for this. Um, these are some of the birds of a feather. Uh, please go and look at that spreadsheet, sign up to it. And if you want to propose another one, we have today and tomorrow to kind of keep doing this. So a lot of this is about providing the opportunity for this diverse community of people to kind of interact with each other and not just listen to talks. Second day is much more about research, so it's going to be kicked off uh, by Giovanni, who from the VP that's leading cloud research at IBM T.G. Watson Research Center. Um, then we're going to have uh, a session dedicated to the open cloud testbed. Um, Mimi uh, from NSF will be, is a program manager in charge of the program that, uh, that actually has funded that, is going to give an overview of that program. And then Michael will be describing sort of the open cloud test in a lot more detail with all the PIs up there for questions. Um, we'll then have an infrastructure uh, research panel for cloud research. And this is, a, again, a really diverse panel that includes um, people developing cloud infrastructure, uh, campus research computing professionals, um, people doing systems research that really need that, and actually commercial cloud providers. So Microsoft is in there as well. So the idea is to bring a diverse community of people that can say, what does the research community need to actually study clouds? And then we have two more sessions of both micro talks and deep dives. So you have a choice of going to those micro talks or going into a deep dive on one of the sessions. Um, again, a very rich set of, of talks. It's going to be kicked off by Hui Li from Futureway, who will be talking about um, the challenges to deploying complex AI systems. And what are all the research challenges that come out of it? And then a rich set of talks about people that have been doing research around the mass open cloud, um, covering a wide spectrum of, of things from different, from IBM, from BU, from Northeastern. Um, and then there's a set of deep dives looking, digging into what people want. So if you look at it, Microsoft, we know now, we now know that every single server in their cloud has a bump in the wire FPGA between the server and the network. None of us have access to program these things. We know that there's all kinds of, they've accelerated Bing by doing that. They've had the capability of offloading all kinds of networking functionality into it. 
you know, so we're trying to provide the first test bed that provides that capability to the general community. So I encourage you, if you kind of want to have that kind of capability, to come and talk to Martin and Miriam, who are going to be leading that session, about what kind of capabilities you want to see in that platform. Um, Open Data Hub, which is this uh, AI platform that we're deploying on the MOC from Red Hat. So Sherrod will be talking about that. Um, Dave Irwin will be giving two tutorials, actually, on how to actually use um, Cloud Lab. Um, so, you know, we really want to transition a lot of people that today have been using, you know, Hill and BMI or what we call Elastic Secure Infrastructure from sort of doing that to actually using the Cloud Lab environment on top of that because that's going to give you a really, the, the capability of deterministic experiments which we've never been able to really do and also it has a whole leasing model so we can share that infrastructure more effectively. Um, so unless you need to control your own pixie booting, we're going to try to shift you onto that environment and I encourage all the students that have been using the capabilities we have today to kind of come to those sessions, as well as other people interested in that. Um, and Peter is going to be actually bringing together a team. So we've been doing a lot of work on hybrid cloud storage, and so sort of, there's a, diver a bunch of people coming into that. Again, we have a whole bunch of breaks, four and a half hours. Um, these will be where the boffs are happening. Uh, look at the boff spreadsheet, figure out which session you want to come to, and, um, and schedule new ones in there. And that's it. So thank you. And thanks to all of you guys. I mean, this is just, this is amazing. Like, now the project has, each component has people, you know, even if we had to drag them out of the basement, that, that, were, um, that, that are kind of experts in, in uh, an aspect of this. And I sort of feel like where we have potential of doing something much, much larger than ever before. So I think the last part is for you to ask us questions. What's that? Okay. Yep. So questions? Um, can somebody, uh, Harul, where are you? Could you pat, run around with us? Okay. Oh, great. Oh, good. Excellent. Sorry, never mind. Never mind. Oh, you can ask a question now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not on, is it? Yeah, I've got one for you, Aaron. So in that slide where you were talking about the vision for... Could you talk a little louder? Is that microphone? In that slide where you were talking about the vision for getting open source clouds to work, federation figured largely. Part of the problem in the industry is that federation and clouds is really a dirty word, right? It's All of the cloud what? service providers want to kill federation because yeah. it's what allows your customers to leave your cloud silo. So as an organization committed to open source and as one that's going to try and expand open source principles, we have to make end users care about federation, otherwise it's just not going to happen. How are we going to do this? So we already hugely care about it in the academic community. That's why this makes sense. And as this grows up here, it'll expand. If you look, for example, John Goodyear's <coughs> going to talk later on about the open storage network, right? Um, they have petabytes of data um, that is that you know, they don't want to put in Amazon because of the download fees. If you look at, um, where's Marseille? Uh, oh, there she is. So they, um, the Harvard Dataverse, they're paying massive amounts for egress fees. So these are all barriers that people are setting up just to kind of lock you into their cloud, right? So if we start this off, um, and this reminds me of when I was in IBM and we were starting off Linux, right? There's the incentive of everybody other than the four clouds to enable this. And this isn't because we're going to supplant the four clouds that exist today. It's because once you demonstrate and you put those capabilities in there, they're all going to need to follow suit. They're going to all have to reduce those barriers to federation. So it's, you know, if there's enough of these clouds that get together, we have a couple of cloud providers that are actually in the audience. Um, and so if we do this academic clouds, we're never going to support commercial users. I mean, we're precluded from doing that. We're an open source, sorry, we're a nonprofit set of organizations. But we'll support them, then this gets replicated into commercial clouds with the same capabilities. Those things are federated, startups start moving to that, and then the big cloud vendors, I believe, will actually be incented to do the same. Aron, I want, so not only, do, not only does academia care about um, you know, federation, but we're actively doing it. I mean, you know, we carry our laptops back and forth between, you know, BU, Northeastern, Harvard. They all work because we have active working identity federation, thanks to, you know, Scott, Wayne, their equivalent at Northeastern, and so on. Can I add one more thing? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Is it okay? Yeah. Can I, uh, Marcia Krauss from Harvard. Yes, a question and a comment. So just in, in a way it's following up on this on the Federation, but more generally, that uh, uh, especially for the two talks from John and Hugh, that, uh, uh, which I liked a lot to just get uh, the, well, the, the open source community grow into these areas. But uh, I'm thinking of what's happening, for example, in Europe with the European uh, Open Science Cloud. It's, uh, they're thinking of a cloud, they're building it differently than what we're talking about here, thinking more a lot of uh, a set of ser services based on uh, uh, th themes of scientific th uh, themes or so. But, uh, but still, there are a lot of, um, well, similarities, and I, I wonder if some of this standardization and, open, and building the open source um, uh, community that, that uh, for the cloud could be done together with them, try to federate with, uh, with the cloud uh, as a starting point. That, that's my question, and, and what, what your thoughts are about that. And the other thing is, the other is more of a comment, but as I see, that going from the experimental, I mean, the, the, one of the, power, uh, the powerful things about uh, uh, this entire project, right, that you can do the research in the cloud and then move some of these experimental, uh, um, uh, well, solutions to, uh, for example, to NERC. But it might be good to set up a governance on that about, I mean, one of the things that I've been working with, uh, with the European Science, Open Science Club to be able to be the, have dataverse deployable data, data for any institution wants to use a dataverse is that it has to pass a whole set of unit tests and, and deployment testing that makes it very easy to be deployed and to be replicated, re, re, that deployment to be reproduced. So something like that, building that standard would be very useful. Thanks. Yeah, very much so, Merce. Um, I think w one of the really interesting things about building an upstream for operations uh, is that it's going to touch federation. Right now, we don't really have an upstream for federation, right? Like, there's nowhere to, for, to run it in, in practice in an open community. Uh, th and there's huge technical challenges that are yet to be solved. Uh, you know, how do you, the, the, the caching work that, that Iran and our CEF team are doing here is just a, is just a first step. There's the the uh, uh, network uh, there's a ton of stuff that needs to be done with networking. Renzi folks are going to talk about some very interesting stuff there. But, it, I mean, I, you know, right, I'm an open source bigot, but we need, we need an upstream for all of this stuff. We need a place where, where, where a community can play with it and see if it really works. And I don't think we've had that really, and I think we so, may get it now. So I, I wanted to actually kind of point this to Scott and Wayne a little bit. The thing is that, we actually had a lot of conversation about how to do governance. We had like several days where between Jonathan and Scott and Wayne and I, we sort of were just discussing what, what do we need to put in place on this. And one of the things that was, I think we were sort of guided by is, you know, John Goodhue's kind of experience in where how the MGH PCC kind of evolved, where there was this level of trust build between a certain set of people. Um, things were deployed for real. And then kind of governance, understanding what to do, kind of evolved out of that in some sense. And I kind of like, so part of the thing is I think we've sort of, I think we want to get MVPs out there. I think we want to federate with all those entities you're talking about. And, um, but I think that the execution that we've had here, I'd like kind of Scott and Wayne to talk about a little bit. Yeah, to kind of, okay. So kind of touch back on the governance aspect of it. And I mean, we do envision there being kind of two sides of it, right? There's, there's taking a service and transitioning it into uh, a place that others can use it at scale in the production environment that would be uh, NERC. There's also taking that and expanding it even further. Um, there has to be governance to an acceptance into that space. And we envision there being a group that does that. You, 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 have a, you perhaps would have a group that would be more scientific minded for for those kinds of experiments, and then and then some that were more for the service end, the operational end that we would deploy, because when we deploy something in the production space, it has to be sustainable, and that's the hardest transition. Um, when it comes to the federation aspect and the, and the whole concept of uh, the open infrastructure labs, I think it, when we come about a common set of tools between different institutions, it becomes easier and easier to deploy the infrastructure. So it takes less people to do that, and so then it would be easier to focus on the infrastructure and focus on the facilitation aspect of it. So that, that will grow, I think, the number of sites that we would have. 
And the open storage network is a good example of what they're trying to do with a Ceph deployment like that across the United States. Um, when it comes to federating across from, from here to, to Europe, one of the things that becomes challenging then is just data. If I have data here and it needs to go there, movement of data between the two is just not very fast. So I, I think federation can happen, and I think you could go as a, as a researcher and get credit to use their facility. Maybe they have bandwidth, maybe they have some cool technology or some software that you want to try there, and vice versa. But that movement of data um, is, is really still a challenge between the continents. So. Yes, yes, definitely we would, she has asked about building the standards together. We should definitely reach out and, and do that with them. I was just going to say um, one quick comment, which is that since we've started talking about this, the Open Infra Labs um, initiative, we have started to, um, to hear from, the, there are a couple of European things happening. There's um, the, the Open Science Cloud. There's also kind of a broader um, set of commercial organizations looking to build European cloud services around that too. And we've had some, some early discussions with both of them. Uh, but I think that, that absolutely, you know, that's, as I mentioned when I was talking, my, my goal is over the next couple of years to expand this to really the globe. <laughs> um, we have some interest from uh, some Japanese institutions as well and, uh, and some Chinese um, uh, universities and companies that, that we've worked with over there. And I do think that, that like, like Scott was saying, if we can, if we can um, agree on some of those those principles about how to build and design these, then it opens up those those opportunities. And I think again, you know, the um, uh, to your question, the academic space is a great space to do this because it has a long history of of being willing to to cooperate and share. <laughs> and so there there's that willingness and that desire already. And I think that's one of the key things that we have to have as a real real world use case to help um, kind of push this forward. Jen? Oh, do we take one more question? One more question. So I'm, I'm going to give you two. Is that okay? <laughs> They're both quick. One is um, with respect to getting the operations of these public clouds like Mass Open Cloud, um, a, one of the trends that we're seeing in the private clouds or the, the, the public clouds run by the companies is that most of the efforts go on into trying to figure out how to back out bad things rather than get good things in. And it seems like we're way behind the curve there compared with those guys. Uh, and if we, if, if we stay behind the curve, if we're, all, if, we, if we're always three or four years behind them or two or three years behind them, um, it, it seems like we're fighting an uphill battle. So my question would be, how do we get ahead of those guys as opposed to just keep trying to catch up? That's question number one. Question number two has to do with why are we so worried about moving data? Um, most of the trends in the computer science community is trying to figure out how to access data in place because moving it is, ha has so many privacy and security implications. So take either one or both. So if I jumped into both those very quickly, I think that we, I, you're absolutely right. I think part of the idea about a federated open cloud is that you can actually ship the computation to where the data is sitting and get resources over there. And that's, that's why federation is critical. Um, if I go to the first question from you, I think that you know, innovation is happening all the time, but you know, to get things from that source to production is huge challenges. So there's papers by some people that are here actually talking about how we could get uh, two orders of magnitude improved serverless platforms, right? There's all these kinds of capabilities, but the, uh, the transition from a research thing to actually an open source project to actually having something pro that's available in a cloud is so difficult that most research things never get to the next stage. Where exactly this project is about is actually trying to actually make a, a pipeline where those things can actually transition from one stage to the other stage. So d just to comment on the... Can oh, I just jump yeah, in real quick? But they do at Google and Azure, right. for sure. And to, and to piggyback on the question about the data, there's, in the STEM areas of science where we have a lot of instruments, most of them create a massive amount of data. And the massive amount of data 
normally changes about an order of magnitude every three, four to five years. Most of us do not have the computational capacity locally where this data is being created to do the computation. I mean, LHC is just a perfect example. We have all sorts of researchers who have different telescopes that are Antarctica. There's not gonna be a computer facility local in that space, so they have to distribute data. And so distributing data and, and finding computation is always gonna be an important endeavor. Um, This off. Um. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. That's awesome.